time for another podcast by George. Straight talk, straight from the heartland, that'll have you saying, by George, I think he's got it. Now, here's George. Hello, hi, how are you? And welcome back on in to another podcast by George. And rejoining us on the podcast, our old buddy, our old friend, Dr. Stephen W. Schmidt. He's the Lucan and Dowd Professor of Politics, Political Science at Iowa State University. He's known as Dr. Politics around the world, really. Um, he's uh, an authority here within the state of Iowa on our political process. And he's also well known by our good friends out in New Hampshire. They're getting ready for the nation's first primaries, you know. And Doc, thanks for coming on back in here. And as you, uh... oh, I want to mention too, I want to show this. This is the book, folks. This is a, the guy literally wrote the book. This is the American government and politics today. It's kind of like a manual. It's in every political science college classroom in the country. This thing's huge, Doc. I've been thumbing through it. I've been trying to pick up some points from it. But honest to God, I'd I'd have to take your course, I think, to read it. Do your do your students read this book in a in a in a course? They have to. Yeah. Front, front, and they read it, and we wrote a. Uh, you know, the first edition came out in 1984. 84. Yeah, and it has come out in a new edition um, every few years, and and so this is the 20th edition now. Um, I wanted a book that my students actually could relate to because the books we were using back then were all text, no graphics, very very dry. And I found a publisher and a couple of colleagues, and they said, let's go for it. So we've been very, very lucky, and, um, you know, I, I, I enjoy writing it and then rewriting it. But the edition you have there is called the Essentials Edition, which is the short version. That's the short version. <laughs> yeah. It is. Yes, there's a hardback edition that has five more chapters that go in depth into things like state and local government and stuff like that. Um, but, um, you know, textbooks are kind of going out of style. Um, mm. I, th I think, you know, people are saying, well, you can get all that stuff on the internet and that may be true, but you're maybe getting a lot of bad stuff on the internet. So, well, one thing about the, uh, the printed book, I mean, they got to be published and reprinted and republished. And I, uh, um, we've got an impeachment hearing that's getting underway that, that might warrant an update to the book. Do you think? Right away. Yeah. The, the big news, uh, obviously, court cases. Um, there are several court cases that may come up that are earth shattering and um, that have to be in the book. I mean, President Trump uh, is shutting down the uh, Dreamer uh, law, which allows kids who came to the U.S. as small children with their parents undocumented uh, to find a path to citizenship or at least residency. And President Trump wants to send them all back to their countries, um, which are not their countries because they haven't been there since they were two or three years old. Uh, and the Supreme Court is going to rule on that. And however they rule, it's going to be, you know, quite an important uh, case. So, yeah, you know, American politics is great, George. It's great because it's so dynamic, you know, it's constantly changing and there are things happening at all different levels at the state level, at the federal level and the three branches of government. And um, it's, you know, that's part of the, what the founders wanted, a dynamic country that breathes, that the constitution is constantly reinterpreted. Um, and, and that's where we are today. Well, and it's great that you brought up the dreamer situation because um, uh, it's easy to forget these things. We still got kids in cages down there on the border. We still have uh, major issues and crises abroad and uh, at home, and we're transfixed with this Trump guy. I mean, <laughs> that's all anybody can think about or or talk about. And when it comes to politics, this impeachment proceeding is this uh, is this what everybody's concerned about? Is this the numero uno issue or not? A lot of people are uh, because, you know, no, the answer is no. Most Americans uh, are really busy trying to make ends meet and pay off their car loans, credit cards, uh, get their kids to school, uh, find a better job, uh, try to deal with incredibly rough weather that you, know, that you have to navigate yeah. and all these other things that are so close to home. But when you look at what is happening with Ukraine and impeachment and President Trump and his staff, um, those are actually deep 
uh, challenges to the Constitution, to how government operates. You know, we're supposed to have checks and balances. In the textbook, George, if you go there, you'll see that nice little graph that we have of the president, the Congress, the courts, and how they all I'll put that balance out. each other off, right? Yeah. And that isn't uh, apparently the way it's working anymore. Uh, the, the president says, I can go and shoot somebody in Times Square and it'll be okay. There is nothing. I mean, one of his uh, people said, no matter what the president does, even if he does shoot someone in Times Square, he cannot be uh, arrested, indicted, or charged yeah. with anything because he's the president. Well, I don't know if Thomas Jefferson and Madison and you know Benjamin Franklin and others um, would agree with it, but uh, in any case, the reason this is important is because it's another test of the Constitution and how our system works. And, you know, regardless of how it comes out, um, it is going to set a, a standard going forward. So if the president is untouchable, when a Democrat gets elected, the Democratic president will be untouchable. You know, it, it's kind of, yeah. Uh, I want to remind my Republican friends of that. Yeah. Well, and, and obviously, he, uh, it, it looks like, it's, I mean, you're foolhardy to uh, predict uh, politics, but it looks like he's going to be impeached in the House, and it, it looks like there's absolutely no way that he'll be convicted in the Senate. It looks like a purely political play at this point to me. And the point that I'm making to folks is these Iowa caucuses are coming up in February. The general election is less than a year away now. And we're not dealing with or talking about uh, the major issues that people will be voting on. And I, I don't think that this impeachment is going to be uh, the determining factor at the ballot box uh, next November. I don't, I don't think that's how people are going to vote Trump or not Trump. It, it's true, but the nice thing is that it's November. That's the crucial thing, not this November. November is a year away. The yeah. general elections are a year away. The impeachment will be over by then, and the Democrats are going to have a um, hard decision to make this summer as to who they nominate for president. Um, and then the, the discussion will be around, hopefully, uh, the bread and butter issues, the things that are close to home and concern people. I mean, climate change, nobody wants to talk about it, but... Um, there are, I just read an article, there are some islands off the coast of the Carolinas that are now in such a threat of being overwashed by the rising sea levels that the people are basically going to have to evacuate them and abandon them. Venice, if you saw the news, people in Venice, I said this morning, I, I posted somewhere, I said, these tourists had better come in scuba gear when they visit Venice. Because it's <laughs> underwater, you know, yeah. and and so those issues will come back up again. And as you and I have talked about a thousand times, health care, uh, health reform, health insurance, um, crucial issue. So what I found most interesting, George, is that right now the new buzz is that big donors and Democratic Party leaders are really worried about the field of, I don't know how many are still running, 15 or 16 uh, Democrats, and saying, can any of these people really beat Trump? That's interesting to me because there's a big choice. But the, the, no, the people in the know are saying, yeah, it's a big choice, but I don't see somebody in there who can beat Donald Trump. And so you've got Bloomberg, uh, mayor, former mayor of New York, and billionaire, fourth richest man in the world jumping in. You've got um, former governor of Massachusetts saying, hey, you know what, uh, Duval Patrick? Yeah, maybe I'll run too, because I don't see anybody. Really? This late, there are new people jumping in? Um, I think that the Democrats ought to be very worried, because by now the field should be winnowed down and not enlarged again. Well, I agree. And here in the state of Iowa, you probably saw uh, the poll this week. Pete Buttigieg, uh, Buttigieg uh, he's a atop the Iowa poll now, uh, just a couple of months before the Iowa caucuses. And, you know, hate it or not, I predicted early on, I said there are three candidates in the current field that I know cannot be elected. Joe Biden is one, Elizabeth Warren is second, and P Mayor Pete 
is the third. None of those three can't. It, it, Barack Obama can't be elected. Yeah, well. <laughs> I remember yeah. I, I looked at that and I thought, Barack Hussein Obama. Whew, yeah, boy, black guy guy with a Muslim name, making, yeah. Uh, you're making a huge mistake. And he finished up two terms in the White House. So you never know uh, what is possible. You never know who catches on fire uh, and why. Uh, Buttigieg now has an initiative where he talks a lot about his military service um, and has talked to veterans. There was a recent article that uh, where he went to a veterans group and a bunch of old, you know, I'm old, so I can say the word old, uh, old veterans were saying, I came just, you know, because I'm a veteran. He was talking about veterans issues and I'm impressed with this guy. Well, you know, who knows, right? Um, you and I uh, are you know, good uh, predictors, but uh, nobody has asked me or paid me to predict anything at this point because oh, it's yeah. it's really uh, unstable right now. I mean, if I if I was a Democratic Party leader, and I went to you and said, George, hundred thousand dollars if you point at the Democrat who may or may not be running, who can win in November of next year. Uh, and you get it right, hundred thousand, maybe a million bucks. Who is it? Who would yeah. you pick? Well, I'm you asking gotta... you, who would you pick? I know, you know St Gabbard. Um, you like Gabbard? Well, yeah, and I, I don't know at this stage of the game if I'd say that she can win. She's only polling two or three percent amongst uh, Democrats. Uh, but I would look at Bernie and think that uh, perhaps he might. And the reason is, I you don't everybody thinks in terms of popular vote. You can't think that way. I mean, we've got a president that didn't win the popular vote. Think in terms of that electoral college. Can an openly gay man, even with his military service, like Mayor Pete? flip those red states will any of those red states turn blue over a guy like that i mean and the religious right doesn't even have him in their crosshairs yet they haven't even started in on this guy i mean i, I don't see that happening but you think a a guy who is not a democrat who is a democratic socialist socialist george can right win right, right. In those states i mean that's another one where i'm just wondering i mean uh, whether that's real well, I, I think the blue states uh, in that Electoral College map will vote for him because he's not Trump. That's kind of the way that I, that I, I look at Bernie. And I think he may flip uh, a few of the red states that could not vote for Hillary uh, Clinton but, but might vote for him and who have that uh, strain of populism running through them where they kind of want to stick it to the uh, big moneyed interests uh, back east and the big powerful you know fortune 500 companies and ceos and and all of that so maybe bernie can can carry some of that i wanted to before we get off i wanted to turn back to this and and, and I, I get off the rails a little bit but I, I know you're you're looking at these uh impeachment hearings as they begin too i look at this and i think to myself i, I try to put myself in a in like a trumpy point of okay people that support trump how do they look at this all right trump was elected basically to upset the apple cart. A lot of people that voted for him wanted to change the way business was done in Washington, D.C. and around the world. So they've got a bunch of these um, uh, diplomatic core folks coming out, and it's going to come down to CIA-supported information and that type of thing. And they, they've all taken great exception and umbrage to the presidency of Donald Trump. They'd like to see him out of there because he doesn't support their way of doing business, certainly. And I look at that and they're going to say, well, yeah, that's why we sent him up there. Trump's doing his job. Go Trump. I mean, that solidifies his core, makes him stronger. Do you think or not? Yeah. Yeah. You know, anytime you attack someone that you like, uh, you just dig in. Right. And so I think his base um, just brushes this off as um, Democratic party politics and an effort to uh, smear and um, basically overthrow or uh, undermine President Trump. Um, but the group I'm looking, I mean, so they, they're unmovable for the most part. Yeah. I think the Democrats, as you mentioned earlier, um, you know, the, they're not going to abandon the Democratic Party. Maybe some will, like they did last time, uh, voting for Trump. But, uh, you know, I think they're dug in as well. So as we've said before, and people need to read my textbook, which is available on Amazon, Stefan Schmidt, American Politics Today, um, 20, 
Eth edition. Yeah, that's the book. Very inexpensive, beautiful, full color, full color pictures and graphs. It's a great book. If, if you read that, you'll see it's the independent voters, the ones that sometimes can swing to the Republican and sometimes can swing to the Democrat in the November election. Ultimately, you know, I'm looking at them and because they, they can make or break a candidate. So they're not, for the most part, um, at this point, very enthusiastic about President Trump. Some of the polls show that they tend to be now leaning more away from him. So, um, you know, if the Democrats are smart and pick someone who is appealing, a good candidate, um, and can mobilize the base of the party and, and go over and reach over to those independents, I think President Trump is going to have to work hard to get reelected. If they pick someone who just doesn't connect, he'll get reelected more easily. And the hearings, you know, the hearings are not for everyone. I mean, right now, right now I'm on a research assignment, I'm conferences and meetings and stuff, so I can afford to take this morning and watch the opening of the hearings. Do you think most Americans can get away from their job and watch those if they have a job? Um, no, they're working, you know, their boss is going to tell them, shut off that computer yeah. or whatever. And so th those hearings are for some of us, but certainly not for most Americans. But there'll be news summaries, you know, of what was said, and people will look at them and kind of go, well, okay, yeah, you know, that's, uh, you know, NATO and Russia. Why all of a sudden are we so happy with Putin and Russia and trying to go after the poor Ukrainians who have fought very hard to get rid of the Russians. Um, so, you know, it's not going to make uh, the big difference, as you said. But, uh, I, you know, the process goes on. And for some reason, which I don't understand, maybe because I've had three cups of coffee, I'm pretty optimistic. You know, I'm thinking we'll make it through this and there will be an election and it'll hopefully be fair and the Russians won't interfere too much, although... We, we are not protecting our ballot um, stations, our, our voting stations, our, our, our ballots. We're not protecting them well. Um, you've seen, I think, the reports on it. Uh, we're very worried about all kinds of hacking of those. Uh, so it may be that this is, you know, the last election where Americans will actually say, yeah, I can live with the results. Uh, it may not be. It may be that whatever the results are, those who lose are going to say like they do in Bolivia and other places. No, that election was rigged and was, you know, not fair. And I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, you know, we're a young country, George. Yeah, we uh, are. You know, we, well, we, we think, you know, this is going to go on forever and we're going to have good elections and safe elections. I've said, and I'm, you know, uh, probably, you know, out there. Uh, on the edge of things, we should go back to paper ballots. Um, yeah, they could be rigged by Mayor Daley in Chicago and a few other places, but paper ballots can't be hacked by the Russians so uh, or anyone else. Um, that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it would be a great idea, too. I'm all for paper ballots. I wanted to mention somebody that will watch these impeachment hearings finished to end is my wife. God love her. She's all over this stuff. She's on top of it. I had a question for you on impeachment itself. You know a hell of a lot more about it than I do. But, you know, I used to, like a lot of folks, impeachment to me was high crimes and misdemeanors. I mean, that's what we always heard. And then I hear that you don't necessarily have to be guilty of high crimes or misdemeanors to be impeached. And even if that were the case, is this a Ukrainian deal, which is, I mean, that's kind of in the weeds. It's hard for me to understand. But are we talking high crimes and misdemeanors here or not? Well, you know, it depends on who's doing the impeachment, right? Yeah, Something like uh, having a sexual encounter with an intern in the White House can be high crimes and misdemeanors because it undermines the dignity and credibility of the presidency. Remember, that's what the Democrats said. And President uh, Clinton lied to a grand jury uh, when he was asked about this. And that was considered to be basically lying to a grand jury is you it's know, a crime. serious offense. Yeah, yeah. Um, so who knows? Uh, the impeachment hasn't worked. It probably never will work. Nobody has ever been removed from office by a conviction of this by the Senate. Um, we've had, you know, some presidents 
impeached by the House, but then they either resign or they're not uh, convicted by the Senate. So, you know, as I've said, Ben Franklin created impeachment and said we need something in the Constitution so we can get rid of a president who might be essentially uh, a threat to the country besides what we're doing now back in the day, which was to kill them. I mean, yeah. in, in the day, he said, you know, we want to have something that's better than uh, killing the, the tyrant. We want to have a legal process. But the legal process has turned out to be basically a turkey, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, so the answer to your question is impeachment is a political process. Um, and it is not a criminal prosecution the way you would basically have a grand jury and convict a, 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 a civil or, or criminal. Um, so live with that. It's a political process. Yeah. The Republicans tried to get rid of Bill Clinton for something that I thought was, you know, I mean, it was hard to Im imagine that a president would admit to having a sexual encounter with an intern at a grand jury, right? Yeah. Uh, so what President Clinton should have done is you should have said, I'm not going to go testify in front of a grand jury. Yeah. I'm the president. Presidents have immunity. And the Congress and you people are trying to undermine the, the way Donald Trump is doing. Donald Trump is just basically saying no and telling his own people, you can't testify. Um, and, and that's an interesting new development there. Yeah, and they're asking him about legitimate matters of policy and state with Bill Clinton, a point that I've always made. The one thing you should never ask a man, that never ask anybody, is whether or not they're fooling around on their wife. Because you can't believe whatever the answer is, and everybody is going to lie about it if they're guilty of it. I mean, absolutely. It had nothing to do with matters of policy and state. He should never have been brought before the grand jury to be questioned about that in specific. And the fact that he was... Uh, impeached on a technicality because of that is uh, I, I, I just a black mark on Amer American history, I think. As my friend Arnie Arneson says, Hillary Clinton should have divorced him. Yeah. I, that would have been better. Speaking of Hillary Clinton, I wanted to ask you, you've seen that Hillary Clinton is talking about getting in the race. What do you think of that? Have you heard that? Yes, of course. That's the, the trio that is saying, now yeah, these people that are running right now, they can't beat Donald Trump. And so Hillary Clinton has apparently been kind of silently, quietly dropping that, that she did really well. She got more popular votes. And if she had campaigned harder in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Ohio, and uh, that she might have won the electoral uh, vote there. Um, I, I don't think so, George. I don't think so. I don't she's, think so she, either. No, I don't think so. She's, she's That's my fourth candidate that cannot be elected. Add her, add her to the list. Hey, you know, I want to mention something about everybody talks about the fact that she didn't go to Michigan and Wisconsin and campaign. No one knows the reason why. They think maybe she was dumb, maybe she was lazy. No, it wasn't any of those things. Her strategists knew that when Hillary Clinton made personal appearances in those states, her numbers went down. It did nothing but get worse for her. So she didn't go. She was better served and came closer to winning those states by not going late in the campaign, particularly, than, than actually going. Yeah. Absolutely true. And, and what you're saying, of course, is um, something that we all have uh, essentially dismissed, right? Because we're saying she didn't go there often enough. What you're saying is she went there too many times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And another time definitely would not it, have helped. Yeah, It would not have helped. But the thing is, I'm working right now and trying to silence my smartphone here. You know, the, oh, this, yeah. is the, this is the era of too many electronic uh, devices. I didn't hear it. That's and, okay. And they, they all pop up all of a sudden, you know, and start making noise. Um, so, um, you think Hillary Clinton probably shouldn't run then? No, oh, yeah, I definitely shouldn't run. I mean, well, unless you want another four years of Donald Trump, and I also put it to people, they everybody says, well, Trump's not going to go quietly. Whenever his presidency is over with, maybe this time or next time, he's not going to quit. Well, he doesn't have to quit. He'll run one of those kids of his. You'll get a Trump Jr. for another four years after that if you run a Hillary Clinton. But she's not. she has no chance. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I, I think that's just crazy. Yeah, I, I crazy don't think talk. it's a smart thing to do. Because oh, my God. The reason is, uh, I mean, you're a kind of pretty much a progressive and a liberal. I yeah, know a yeah, lot yeah. of Democrats. I know a lot of Republicans as well. But most of the Democrats that I know 
didn't like her much. They voted for her probably, but they they certainly don't think that she should do this. So uh, Hillary, forget it. Bloomberg, forget about uh, it. Yes, I mean, you can't skip, you know, Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, and South Carolina and jump in there in a, a few fringe primary somewhere. Um, the fourth richest man in the world, Jewish guy, um, registering to be in the primaries in some southern states. I don't think so. I, you know, that's that's not going to work. You know, the Democrats need to be concerned about the current slate. They're getting worried, and that's why they're starting to look Hillary's way, and she's talking about it. You know, I, I, I'm i going to – we got to close it off here, but I, I'm going to run a, a little bit of a clip. I, I saw this on YouTube, and I know it, yeah, you've seen it many times, but it's uh, – John Kennedy, back in 1960, uh, before the convention there, talking about Medicare for all, basically, talking about health care for all Americans. What we are now talking about doing, most of the countries of Europe did years ago. The British did it 30 years ago. We are behind every country pretty nearly in Europe in this matter of medical care for our citizens. And then those who say... But 70 years ago to private effort in those hospitals in new jersey where the doctors said they wouldn't treat anyone who paid their hospital bills through social security those hospitals and every other new hospital the american people all of us contribute one half one or two thirds for every new hospital the national government we pay 55 percent of all the research done we help young men become doctors we are concerned with the progress of this country. And those who say that what we are now talking about spoils our great pioneer heritage should remember that the West was settled with two great actions by the national government. One, in President Lincoln's administration, when he gave a homestead to everyone who went West, and in 1862 he set aside government property to build our land-grant colleges. This cooperation between an alert and progressive citizen and a progressive government is what has made this country great. And we shall continue as long as we have the opportunity to do so. That's interesting in and of itself. He was a big proponent of it back then. He was, uh, you know, countering the same arguments that are being raised today. I, it's, a, it's an interesting clip. But more importantly, I look at that and I think, my God, who have we got like that today? And more importantly, will we ever have anyone like that again? And you and I have talked about this because of the media, uh, because of uh, hate incorporated, basically, that, that's out there. Uh, are we ever going to see a resurgence of Camelot with either party? I, I mean, is there ever going to be anybody that anybody likes again, like a John Kennedy or maybe for the Republicans, a Ronald Reagan? Is that going to happen ever again? Uh, you know, why not? I mean, there must be people who are unifiers, who are dynamic, who are charismatic. Um, Kennedy, remember, had to give a speech and say, yes, I'm a Catholic, um, but the Pope is not the person who tells me what to do. Because people said Kennedy can't get elected. He's a Catholic. And yeah. Americans really don't like Catholics very much. So you got to remember the obstacles that he overcame. You also got to remember it was a different period in the sense that um, boy, talk about Bill Clinton and, and the White House and interns. I mean, Kennedy was all over the place, but in oh, those no. days, the media didn't report it. He they would, the other way. Of, he would yeah. sneak out of the White House and have the Secret Service drive him to New York to have trysts. I don't know if your viewers know what the word what a tryst tryst is. is I, yeah. I, I think, I, think I, I know what it is. Maybe I'm wrong. But, um, that, that, that is gone because there's no longer per personal life for candidates. And if people had known in those days more about Kennedy, he probably wouldn't have been elected because, you know, he was a he was a dog. He was a hound dog. Yeah, and, he was. <laughs> and and so, um, you know, yeah. I'm, as I said before, those three cups of coffee make me very optimistic this morning. Uh, there must be people out there who are are really true leaders, and and one of them will pop up at some point. Maybe not this time around, but. Um, but their personal lives now are a big problem because, um, you know, powerful people like Kennedy and like Trump and like a lot of others um, are not very disciplined uh, in their personal life. And so 
powerful leaders like that have a lot of stuff in their background that the media today can dig up easily. Uh, and, and that's a shame. God, who'd in have thought way, we'd in a way, it's a shame. Who'd have thought we'd have ended with similarities between John F. Kennedy <laughs> and and Donald Trump? Here's one thing I will say that when you met, we're talking that kind of that uh, that crazy talk that was against Kennedy was well, you know, if we elect him president, he'll answer to the Vatican instead of uh, to the United States. Well, that, that's just that's about as crazy as Donald Trump uh, answering to the Kremlin instead of the United States. I mean, that he's a Russian agent, that he's... Or Tulsi, yeah. or, or Tulsi Gabbard. Being oh, my God, don't get me started right, on Tulsi right, Gabbard. Yeah, right. you know how I feel about... Honest to God, Doc. I, I mean, I, I just want to say my piece about Tulsi here. And she, by the way, talking about Hillary Clinton, she's uh, submitted a letter to Hillary to try to get her to apologize. For, good luck with that. But anybody... You're looking at this Russiagate thing, and I have been all along, and my God, I, I just don't think that there's anything to this, number one. I think it's a way for Hillary Clinton to cover her tracks on losing that election. I think it's the way for the CIA and the spooks and the uh, intelligence agencies to uh, control government, which they saw slipping away with the presidency of, of Donald Trump. But that all falls into the realm of conspiracy theory. Kind of, I've been accused of that, being a conspiracy theorist. And then Hillary Clinton herself comes out and accuses Tulsi Gabbard of being a Russian asset, a candidate for the U.S. presidency from the Democratic Party, a serving member of the military, three terms in the service, uh, uh, taking a sworn oath um, both with the military and with the House of Representatives. She's on the intelligence committees, the armed services committees, all of those things, and Hillary Clinton's calling her a Russian asset. So I'm telling folks, anybody that'll listen to me anyway, if you need proof that that's a that that's more than a conspiracy theory, Hillary Clinton just proved it to me. Well, of course, others would say, yeah, why is Tulsi Gabbard on all those military defense and intelligence committees? She's a mole, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh yeah. George, George, you're you're just oh my missing, God. you're missing the point there, aren't you? Oh my God! How crazy, crazy, crazy! Well, Doc, I know you got other things to do. This is, I mean, I, I mean, I'm laughing because this, this is fun. It always is. Who would think? Uh, as a young man, I guess I would never have thought that politics could be <laughs> this much fun or even funny ever. But uh, it, it actually can. That's a great time. We want to thank him again. That's our good friend. That's our good pal. That's uh, Doctor Stephen W. Schmidt, Doctor Politics, as he's known around the world. He's the Luke and Endowed Professor of Political Science at Iowa State University. And today's guest on a podcast by George.